Welcome. I'm Miriam Knight, and my guest today is Norman Rosenthal, MD. Norman is a clinical professor of psychiatry at Georgetown Medical School and the New York Times best-selling author of books including Transcendence, Healing and Transformation Through Transcendental Meditation and The Gift of Adversity, The Unexpected Benefits of Life's Difficulties, Setbacks, and Imperfections. We certainly have those. He conducted research at the National Institute of Mental Health as a research fellow, researcher, and senior researcher for more than 20 years. And he was the first psychiatrist to describe and diagnose seasonal affective disorder, or SAD. Today, we're going to discuss his new book, Supermind, How to Boost Performance and Live a Richer and Happier Life Through Transcendental Meditation. Welcome, Norman. Thank you. I am so delighted to have you because I've been curious about TM. I've heard so, so much about it. Now, you've already written one book about transcendental meditation, which was a bestseller. So why did you feel the need to write another one? That's such a great question. Um, <laughs> one, that I, one that I've asked myself many times. I'm just kidding. Um, you, you know, it turned out that when I was done with writing Transcendence, I thought I had said the last word on the subject. Otherwise, of course, I would have said more. But, you know, if you're, if you're a decent writer, you only write that which you know and that which is necessary. And what I knew at that time was that TM is an extraordinary tool for settling down the nervous system in a way that makes life much calmer and happier and uh, is actually very beneficial for one's health, including one's cardiovascular system. You know that strokes and heart attacks are amongst our biggest killers, and it reduces those uh, illnesses and extends life. So that was quite remarkable. So TM settles the nervous system down. What I then realized as I continued to meditate is that it also wakens the mind. It wakens consciousness. It makes you more capable in almost every way you can imagine in terms of um, creativity, effectiveness, memory, uh, and just getting plain, getting things done. But besides that, you know, because we're not just performers, we're, we're human beings, as it has been said, not human doings. The actual experience of life improves. You feel happier. You feel like you're leading a richer life. And others around you seem to respond much better as you put out all that positive energy. So this whole concept of expanding the mind to its maximum potential that happens as you continue TM warranted a completely new and separate book. Well, we'll certainly get into that as we go through this interview, but I'm curious as to what led you to TM in the first place. Well, in the very first place was back in South Africa in the early 1970s. The Beatles had just returned from India where they had visited Maharishi, who was the modern founder of the technique, even though it is a very ancient technique. He brought it to the West, packaged it in a way that could be easily done, and encouraged research and developed training programs. And basically, uh, they had visited him. They came back. It seemed like the cool thing to do. <laughs> it was the 1970s, and you may remember, I don't know if you were around then, but I was. They say if you remember the 70s, you weren't there. But <laughs> that's, that's not really... They said that about the 60s, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I've modified it a little. So in, in any event, yes. So, so uh, it was flower power and make love, not war. And so uh, with a friend, I toddled off to this little place where they were teaching TM. And um, I didn't take it very seriously. And that was a very big mistake because it's, it's useless to regret. Uh, but I used the fact that I let it drop for 35 years as a way of encouraging young people who pick it up to really persevere because it can really shape and transform the trajectory of a person's life. And it has done mine, even though I re revisited it so many years later. So um, 
What is the transcendent part of transcendental meditation? How is TM different from other forms of meditation? Well, that's a great question because it is all in the transcendence. As you're implying, there are many different kinds of meditation. TM is one of them. And what is unique about TM or special about TM is that it uses a mantra, which is a word sound that comes very automatically. Uh, if you're taught correctly, it comes automatically and you access it that way. And it takes you into a very special place in your mind. It is as though you're going to this very um, happy, blissful, quiet place where you are alert and calm all at the same time. And um, it's unusual because that's not part of our ordinary consciousness where we think about waking or sleeping or dreaming. It is really a separate state of consciousness. And so as you do your TM twice a day, which is what is recommended, you dip into this, it's almost like you're bathing in this river of consciousness twice a day. And then, and that was all in the first book, but then what happens is that that consciousness begins to filter into your daily life. It infuses your daily life. And so you begin to feel that very pleasant, blissful state side by side with your alert active mind. So, you know, we're talking now, we're engaged in a conversation, and yet I still feel that calmness and stability as I talk about it. So you're almost like operating on two channels simultaneously. Mm. It's, uh, and you mention in your book, it's sort of the observer state. Yes, yes. You, you, you kind of, one of my friends is a, a hedge fund owner, and he says when he's in a negotiation, he feels like a ninja. Uh, for those of you who saw, you know, hidden tigers or crouching dragons, I never get that. <laughs> the other way around, but that's The fine. other way around. <laughs> but <laughs> what I do remember is that things came at you very, very slowly, you know. If somebody threw a javelin at you, you know, you came slowly so you could just snatch it out of the middle of the air. And he says that's kind of how it happens with him when he's in a negotiation. He can kind of pick these things off uh, because he's thinking quickly, but it feels like it's happening in slow motion. Actually, this is Ray Dalio. That's Ray Dalio. Mm -hmm. um, I was impressed by one of his comments where he talked about um, that as he continued his practice and continued to transcend, he's actually seen his perspective on life ascend, and he sees everything in a wider perspective, mm -hmm. in a wider context. So yes. th I, I think that was fascinating because when you see things in a broader context, you actually can um, understand uh, relationships and empathize in a way that you can't when you're caught up in the in the intensity of the the minute. Absolutely, that is the nature of this growth of consciousness, which I talk about. That's the nature of the supermind; it keeps growing. So you start transcending in the actual meditation, then you begin to feel it coming into your daily wakefulness, and then it's almost like expands to embrace other people and other entities, and you feel a, a connection with the, the wider world, with the universe. You see yourself as only being part of a vast fabric, and it's a very wonderful feeling that occurs as consciousness continues to grow. I talk about a friend of mine, um, Dr. Richard Friedman, is a psychiatrist in the New York area, writes for the New York Times, and has noticed that as he uh, walks about the city and sees homeless people lying on the sidewalk, he doesn't kind of walk past them as though they're just lumps of stuff. He wonders, who is this person? Where did he come from? How did he get here? There is a kind of an opening up of a sort of, a lens opens up to wonder about the wider world than one's own immediate needs and worries and cares. Now, that is what I am all about in New Consciousness Review. It's open, the opening of consciousness to embrace 
the wider picture. So how do you define the differences among consciousness, cosmic consciousness, and supermind? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. You know, what the Vedic pundits, the experts, realized is that consciousness can expand to the point that it occupies 24-7 uh, of your day, that you are having this kind of extra awareness both during the day and even at night. So let me and, stop you there just yes. a moment. So consciousness, you're equating with awareness. Uh, well, it's not really awareness. It is, yes. It's a kind of awareness. But, you know, awareness has a different, different meanings because you can be aware of something and you can just be also generally aware. You know, you can say somebody is, is a very aware person. It's like everything that happens, they take it in versus, oh, I'm aware that there was somebody there in the room, you know. So this is a more broader sense of awareness, mm -hmm. uh, and that's right. So the experts had recognized that this kind of consciousness grew to the point that it was there all the time, and they called that cosmic consciousness. Hmm. Now, originally, I was going to call the book Cosmic Consciousness, but ah, it's... Ah, I, I hear our break music starting ah, in the background. Okay. So I don't want to embark on this important subject <laughs> and have to cut you off. So as a reminder to our listeners, we are speaking with Dr. Norman Rosenthal about Supermind. Stay with us and we'll be right back. Now, just before the break, we were speaking about cosmic consciousness and Norm, you were just about to explain to us what that is. Yes, yes. As I was saying, um, it's been observed that as awareness expands in some people who've been meditating for a good while, it, it fills the whole day and even the night. And I can talk about that strange effect later. And I was originally going to call the book Cosmic Consciousness, but what then emerged is that there are many people who have expanded consciousness very early in the game, even after days after starting to learn. That's very, very powerful. That goes into the daytime. It may not uh, take the entire day like the traditional definition of cosmic consciousness requires, but it may nonetheless be very, very powerful. So it turned out that it was much better to have a different name that encapsulated all the degrees of the growth of consciousness from these early uh, sproutings of this growth of consciousness all the way through to the full flowering. And uh, it seemed like it was a good name for a modern age supermind because it really tells you what this thing does for you, which is make you absolutely as smart and capable and effective as you can be and happy. Now, many people have had transcendent experiences and entered into the state of cosmic consciousness without ever having done uh, TM. And in fact, you, you do mention that in the book. And it seems to have a similar effect in that it really changes you quite fundamentally. Yes, absolutely. I, I have a chapter in the book called Transcendent Surprises. You know, these flashes that come out of the blue and can be really transformative. I should say that some people have flashes out of the blue and they actually aren't transformative. So it doesn't always follow. But there are some very, very famous examples, and I, I list some of them, including in Eckhart Tolle's book, where... He woke up in the middle of the night and, and felt quite changed in a very fundamental ways that lasted. And there, there's an astronaut that I talk about who, in, in addition, had this effect when he saw the world as he kept uh, revolving around the world. Um, he had this sense of awe and grandeur of the universe that sort of stayed with him. And there are several instances that I cite, and these were transformative. Now, when you are saying, well, listen, I want to develop these wonderful traits, it's no good to say, well, sit around and wait till one of these flashes occurs. 
um, because you could wait a long time. It's much better if there's a predictable method, and that's what I was so excited to share with the readers. Uh, I am a clinical psychiatrist by training and a researcher. I like it when I can tell people, if you do these this, thus and such things, these are some of the things you can expect to develop. That's what happened when I worked with light therapy. You know, I, I was mm -hmm. very pleased that I could expose people with seasonal affective disorder to bright light and bring them out of their depressions. So I like it when I can prescribe some uh, well-defined method and then um, expect some predictable outcome. You actually describe a number of changes in the brain that have been observed by various researchers. What are the implications of these changes, and what were the changes? Well, one very interesting change in the sort of very advanced form of cosmic consciousness where people actually feel awareness during sleep. And it's almost unbelievable because to those of us who are regular sorts, and certainly I qualify in that regard, at least with, with, with regard to my sleep, some people may question uh, whether it extends to my waking hours, but in my <laughs> sleep, <laughs> I'm either asleep or awake. You know, there's nothing in between. And um, yet these people say they are sleeping, they're not sleep deprived, they're not suffering from insomnia, but throughout the night there's a kind of awareness that never really goes away. Is that like lucid dreaming? It is not exactly. It's, it's analogous because when you are having lucid dreaming, you're having two states of consciousness coexisting. You are conscious and dreaming at the same time. Here you are conscious and sleeping at the same time. But conscious and of what? Not of anything. You just have a sense that consciousness never goes away. It doesn't actually have an object. You can't say in the next morning what happened that you were conscious of. It's not that kind of consciousness. It's just an awareness that is described by these people. But here's the interesting piece, because I can imagine that there would be more than one skeptic out there in the audience, and <laughs> I certainly was one of them. And uh, But when they looked at the brain waves, the EEGs, they found the typical very slow waves associated with sleeping, the so-called delta waves. And on top of the delta waves superimposed were the alpha waves that are associated with transcendental meditation. And this kind of superimposed alpha on delta is extremely unusual. And that was what uh, really made a big impression on me, that it coincides with their consciousness. I think it's interesting that the medical community has taken TM to its heart. Um, I was even recommended uh, by my medical doctor to take TM, you know, for my blood pressure. Well, I think a very big step in that direction was the uh, finding by the American Heart Association or the recommendation by the American Heart Association that endorses TM specifically for as an alternate or complementary form of treatment for high blood pressure. So it doesn't say meditation, it says TM. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, doctors take the recommendation of the American Heart Association very seriously, as they should. Indeed, that was quite a, a, an advance for alternative practices in general. Um, and I was impressed by the book that it is really aimed, I would say, at the mainstream as opposed to the New Age or alternative community, uh, particularly with all of the endorsements and everything that you have, like Hugh Jackman and Ray Dalio and so on. Um, why do you think it has gone so mainstream? Well, I think firstly there's a lot of data and people respond to data. And secondly, you know, when you have this kind of experience and you see it, I like, I would say a good 20 to 25% of my patients meditate and they do it regularly. I don't have to remind them or nag them. They just do it, you know, and it's made huge differences to them that many of them have recommended it to family members. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when firstly there's data and secondly, there are many personal 
anecdotes of transformation, uh, it's compelling. And I think we're all really hungry for ways that don't involve medicines to enhance our capacities. You know, we're in, we're in a world where it's very demanding. There are demands 24-7. Um, and we need to have all our neurons working for us and firing for us. And I think that when you see a method that does as much as this one does, and that's why Supermind is called that, because it does do super things and with many, many stories to back it up, I think that it's reached a tipping point whereby people say, well, you know, maybe I should try that. Have you actually tried TM? Um Yes, in fact, uh, in response to your book, I uh, did some research on the actual practice. I, I meditated for many years, but I've never tried TM specifically. I've never been to a TM instructor. Um, so I did find a book on the web that described the, uh, the, the method. Um, I'm sure that uh, you would urge people to go to a certified TM practitioner. But that does cost money, doesn't it? Well, yes, it does. It does cost money, and pretty much everything costs money. Um, I, think, I think that people have asked me, is this book that you've written a how-to book? And I say, it's not a how-to book, it's a why-to book. It's why should you take 20 minutes of your precious time twice a day, your most finite and valuable resource, and spend it on this activity? And um, so I think that in that regard, you've got people who've been trained. They're, they've got mortgages like everybody else, and they've got to feed their children and educate their children and do all, all the things that you and I have to do. So they do need to be compensated. But the level of dedication that I've seen in these teachers in terms of wanting to be sure that you get the technique absolutely right. Now, it may be that you from the web were able to, you know, get a wonderful outcome. And certainly I hope you have. But I think that it almost, if, if one can afford it, I think it's just shy of $1,000 currently, and it's a lifetime guarantee that they will be there with you, you know, helping you get it straight. And, and you might say, well, once you've got the technique, why would you even need them? But I can't even tell you how many times I have gone back to the well and said, would you mind just kind of checking my technique? And invariably I learn something and it deepens my practice. So if this is something that's going to make such a difference, and if you can afford it, um, then I think it would be really the best to go to, you know, a TM teacher, and they are listed in the, you can get that as well off the web, get properly taught, uh, and be sure that you're uh, making that connection. Because, you know, it took me a while before I transcended. It didn't come right away. And had I not had people holding my hand, you know, and helping me with it, I don't even know if I'd be here talking about this today. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I really do encourage it. Yes, I do. Not because I'm a member of some tribe, but just because I think you, you want to do things right. And I understand that there are uh, uh, financial assistance uh, forms available. For Absolutely. They don't mm -hmm. want to let you go without learning. If right. you are motivated, they will find a way. They teach very wealthy people and they say, for every one of you, we're going to teach a veteran, we're <laughs> going to teach a homeless person, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, another break. So stay with us. We'll be right back with Dr. Norman Rosenthal. Norm, you had your own transcendent experiences, but not as many as one would expect. When you had them, was there something that precipitated them? Is there something that can guarantee that you will have one? You know, <laughs> this is so funny because we all want these like amazing experiences. But of course. Of course we do. And the other day I had one 
it just happened. Oh my goodness, and it didn't even get in the book. Well, no, the, the rotten thing waited until the book was published. <laughs> so, so you know I'm not making it up because if I was going to make it up, I would have made it up before the book went to press. But anyway, this is what happened. I was just kind of transcending and um, I felt in the transcendence, I felt, you know, I am slipping into infinity right now. This is what infinity feels like. No beginning, no end, endless. Um, you know, how does one even describe infinity? But that's how it felt. It was like I, I slipped through a crack in our finite real world and into this amazing place. And it didn't last very long, but it was very powerful. And then... As the mantra came to me, this and this never happened before or since, it was like, like you know how the waves break. You see them on the Hawaiian beaches with these surfers that can go for what seems like miles on the, on the crest of these mm -hmm. humongous waves. Well, that's how it felt. It was like humongous waves of consciousness kind of breaking again and again and again with the mantra. The consciousness was like waves coming over me. Now... That's very dramatic, but 999 times, I'm just going to have the ordinary transcendence, which is pretty wonderful in and of itself, but nothing spectacular that I could describe like that. Well, can but, you describe the transcendence? Yeah, yeah, I can, you know, like for example, because even when I was writing my first book and I was trying to describe it. <laughs> and the thing about it is as soon as you try and describe it, it goes away. It's like that little, it's like that optical illusion, you know, with the black dots with a little gray one in the middle. And the minute you look at the little gray dot, it goes away. That's kind of how it is because in, in reality, transcendence is not when you're actively thinking of something. You're accessing the mantra and then you go into this space in the mind. There's a wonderful Vedic quote that said, the, there is a mind within the mind, a mind beyond the mind. Uh, and, then I'll, I'll, and then it says, dwell there and go nowhere else. So I was just intrigued by this first part, the mind within the mind, the mind beyond the mind, because it is like you slip into this place and it's quiet and it's pleasant. And you go, you've gone deep inside yourself. Some people compare it to going down deep into the ocean where it's very still and quiet. Whereas on the top, there are these breakers and big waves and turbulence right down deep. It's quiet and still. That's how it feels mostly. And I'm not actually thinking about anything. I, I don't know what is the day of the week. I don't know. I don't care. You know, if somebody woke me up and said, you know, shook me and said, you know, what day is it? I would figure it out. You know, it's not like I've lost uh, track of, you know, uh, orientation for, as we used to say, place, time, place, and person. <laughs> That's how we used to check if people were oriented. No, you're oriented, but you don't care because you're at this wonderful place that is the transcendent. Now, it's not the dramatic thing I just described or that other people describe, but what's being found is that you don't need that dramatic stuff, that the very peaceful, blissful transcendence, that is going to grow your supermind as well or as much as anything else. But perhaps and more slowly. No, no, no reason to believe no. that, you know. I mean, that's a hypothesis, but there's no evidence. There's no evidence for me that the day after I had that very dramatic thing was a better day than any other. I have nothing to, to speak to on that point. So uh, the person who perhaps... Uh, commented most charmingly about it was Maharishi himself when they asked, you know, which is better, a deep meditation or a shallow meditation? He said, they're both just as good, he said, because even in a shallow dive, you get wet. <laughs> Indeed. Well, as you were describing your transcendent experience, I was reminded of an experience I had when I was about 14. I was lying on my back at um, in a field, looking up at the stars, and I felt my body 
actually separate my consciousness, separate from my body and head up toward the stars. And I had this absolute knowing that I could just keep on going. And then I got frightened and that pulled me back into my body. And I'm wondering whether the preparation of TM is, um, is such that it enables you to accept these experiences without fear. And maybe it's the absence of fear that allows you to transcend. That's a really fascinating question. I think that's, that's right. That's right. And it also then enables you to accept those things when they occur in your daily life, you know, and re- realize that they're just consciousness growing. But talking of that reminds me very much of the questionnaire that I created. Uh, I created a questionnaire all about the growth of consciousness and what it yields. And one of the questions was, are you less afraid of death since you started meditating? And I gave it to over 600 TM meditators who'd been meditating for varying amounts of time. And there was a high percentage that said, we're less afraid of dying. And um, again, you know, Maharishi had something uh, wonderful to say about it. He said, you know, because you're so used to transcending, slipping in and out of this sort of state twice a day, you know, over a period of time, it feels like just one more transcendence. The, the fear of letting go is so much less. He said, death feels just like letting a bird out of a cage. Well, now, Norman, having a master's degree in experimental psychology myself, I really must ask you if you have ever considered offering that same questionnaire to meditators of a different form of meditation. I have, actually. I I have, what I've done in the book is I have put the questionnaire out there uh, with, you know, all of its elements. I've, in the, in the end notes, I've given all the uh, statistics that we did, and I won't bore your uh, listeners with that. I, I'm a researcher by training, so I, I wanted to put my methods out there so people could look at it. I would love to see people who've done mindfulness be interviewed with a questionnaire. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to do it because it's time and money and effort that I, I don't have at my disposal and I don't have the population at my disposal. But I would love some mindfulness researcher to say, wow, wouldn't it be interesting to give the same questionnaire to people who've been doing mindfulness? Let's see how they respond. And I would be fascinated at the results. So you mentioned mindfulness as a form of meditation, and then we have TM. There was a third form of meditation that you mentioned in your book. Well, you know, mindfulness really is two kinds. One is focused attention. Mm -hmm. If you're focusing on uh, an image or an object, some people use that as a a form of mindfulness. Like a flame or... Yes, Mm -hmm. an image, a flower, a mandala, Mm -hmm. uh, that could be one form of mindfulness. And the other form is called open monitoring, uh, which means, you know, something, you're monitoring something that is spontaneously arising, like your breath, for example, or what thoughts are passing through your mind in a moment-to-moment way. So there are two kinds of meditation that go under the rubric of mindfulness, And uh, so those are the three kinds. There's the TM and these two forms that go under the rubric of mindfulness. And they're all intended to take you into a a deeper state and, and to expand consciousness. Not really, because when you look at what the goal of mindfulness is, it's not to shift your consciousness. That's not part of the deal. It's to enable you to perceive accurately and in the moment and with a positive attitude the changes that are going on moment to moment and the goal is not to alter consciousness but to gain insight into the nature of the world external and internal by virtue of your minute focus on the moment to moment experience that sounds like a very delicate distinction No, it's actually very profound. They will not claim, 
I've spoken to mindfulness people. They will not claim that um, there are changes in consciousness. And in fact, there are brain differences in people. I do have a chapter, as you might have seen, on comparing mindfulness and, and transcendence. Mm-hmm. And for example, there's a deep-seated set of circuits, and I'm talking quickly because the music is going to come on any moment. <laughs> um, uh, this deep-seated set of circuits called the default mode network that comes alive when you're not actively thinking about something in particular. And bottom line is in mindfulness, it shuts down because you are by definition, focused on stuff. And in transcendental meditation, it kind of uh, wakes up and comes alive because by definition, you're not focusing on something. You're accessing something in a very automatic way. So this is a very opening form of, I guess, a transcendent form of meditation. I would say so, you know. (laughs) I think people find that it helps them stay in the zone. Uh-huh. And I've got a whole chapter on being in the zone for athletes and for artists. It helps people who are in the creative areas. And I talk about actors and writers. And, um, well, the writer I mostly talk about is myself. How, you know, I can be completely blocked and then go and meditate and come back. And, and uh, it just comes pouring out afterwards. Somehow mm. something's unblocked me. So, your concept of opening up is very real and valid. Well, when we come back from the break, I'd like to go into some of the examples that you describe of, uh, I guess, of famous people, because we tend to look to them with a certain authority. Uh, And, um, you know, if it works for them, maybe it'll work for us. So there is our music, and we will be back with Dr. Oh, what is your website? Uh, yes, normanrosenthal.com. Aha. Uh-huh. Just my name, normanrosenthal.com. Very good. We will be back with Dr. Norman, and we'll conclude our interview about Supermind. Miriam Knight speaking with Dr. Norman Rosenthal. And I just want to point out that I'm excited to announce that our show has been accepted for inclusion on iHeartRadio. So if you're an iHeartRadio fan, you can listen to our show through their platform. So uh, Norman, at this time in our final segment, I want to kind of tie this up with the practical benefits to one's life from doing this TM meditation, because obviously, as you said, this book is not a how to, it's a why to. So give us some examples of why it would be good to do this. You know, there are so many ways. Let me run quickly through the chapter headings. There's Connecting body and mind. I think of the story of Megan Fairchild, a principal dancer for the New York City Ballet, who was having fainting episodes that basically jeopardized her career. Started TM, absolutely stopped having these episodes. So it connected her body and mind. It stabilized her dancing. It stabilized her, you know, security on her feet. And she proceeded with her brilliant career. But that wasn't all. She then began to contemplate doing things she had never dared to do before, like sing, like act. She auditioned for a Broadway show on the town, got the part in the audition room, and had a a wonderful one-year experience with that show and was well-reviewed and found her whole world had opened up. So that's typical. You know, you go into it for one thing, maybe you'll go into it for your blood pressure, maybe you'll stabilize your blood pressure, and then you'll find all kinds of amazing things happen, like next chapter, building a better brain, Cameron Diaz on the set of a movie in Los Angeles in the zoo when it's over 100 degrees heat, and she can't even remember her lines, she's so hot, goes into her trailer, does her TM, comes back, nails the line nails all the lines to the delight of the grip men who were ready to kill her for not 
being able to remember and keeping them there in the heat. Being in the zone, I talked with you about that wonderful story of a friend of mine, Barry Zito, former Major League Baseball pitcher who helped turn around a World Series from his uh, TM, which helped him to get into the zone. Many people who are artists, Hugh Jackman meditated before hosting the Oscars. Uh, Katie Finneran, two-time uh, Tony Award winner, all TMers, incidentally, routinely meditates before she goes on stage. Internal growth, how it grows who you are as a human being, being authentic, uh, being the person, the best person you can be. Jackman speaks freely about how he accessed authenticity through this technique. Engagement and detachment, you know, um, we were taught we need to love, we need to work. That was Freud's great dictum, to love and to work. Both, of course, wonderful things. But what if a relationship isn't working? What if a job isn't right for you? As they say, as the country and Western song goes, you've got to know when to hold them and when to fold them. Mm. How do you extricate yourself graciously? How do you deal with loss? The support of nature, that, that's a term for the experience that everybody's kind of helping you. Everybody's kind of lifting you up. People are rooting for you. But that's really because you are putting out such better energy. And then uh, wealth and happiness. I have two chapters on how in, I have no doubt that if those are your goals, and there are certainly happiness is pretty much everybody's goal, and wealth is many people's goal, these are goals that can be furthered by uh, this practice and the growth of the supermind. So I would say if you consider all those different elements, uh, it's pretty expansive set of promises. And I have experienced them and so have many of my patients and friends. So I, I can put this forward with all honesty and confidence. As a psychiatrist, what would you say are the mechanisms involved in these internal switches? What a terrific question. You know, I honestly think we don't know. Like we've seen the brain, the EEGs, and we've seen how the alpha waves sweep over the brain and they, these calming waves sweep over the frontal part of the brain where executive decisions are made, you know, that are going to make you decide whether you're going to lead your life in a thoughtful way or in an impulsive way, shooting from the hip. Um, so this could be a way in which it strengthens it. But are these alpha waves really the mechanism or are they just the output of changes that are going on in a different place? You know, we know all about the alpha waves because that is something we can measure. But it's like the man who, who uh, dropped his keys at night. Yes. He it was looks... looking under the lamp, right? <laughs> because that's said, where he could see. Yeah. Did you drop it there? He said, no, no, I dropped it somewhere else, but this is the only place I can see. So I don't know if we're just building theories and of mechanisms based on what we've actually measured, just because we can't measure the more fundamental things. Uh, so it's a little bit of a mystery, but we do see changes very predictably. Have your intuitive senses expanded as a result of your meditation? Yes, they have. They have because, you know, I've become a better listener. Um, I've, you know, oftentimes you'll talk to somebody and you'll see that they're not really listening or they're kind of preparing what they're going to say to you when your lips stop flapping. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, that's often the case in business where people are busy on their Blackberries or iPhones, you know, while you're yakking. And then, you know, when it's their chance to talk, they put the iPhone down and now they're, they're fully engaged. So I think that you take in information much more effectively if you are in a more aware state and you are able to, therefore, process things much better. So I would say that's part of intuition. Part of intuition is picking up all the clues. Mm. You made, uh, you used the phrase fully engaged. 
And I think this is really the cornerstone of effectiveness in life. It's being fully engaged in what's going on around you. Would you agree? Well, I would agree partially because I think that sometimes when, you, when people are daydreaming, I would hate to say that that's wasted time. I mean, that may be how Einstein figured out his theory of relativity. He was daydreaming. Yeah, but he can be fully engaged in his daydreaming. Well, yes, but then what does it really mean if we talk about, you know, we don't normally talk about daydreaming as being fully engaged. We, we, we regard it as being disengaged. Mm. But I think your characterization is actually more accurate. I think, yes, I think we should be engaged in our dreams because I think that they are rich sources of inspiration and creativity. I don't think we should be on point all the time. I think if I'm observing what's going on around me every moment of the day, I think I'll block all my creativity. That's my concern. So do you see yourself as continuing TM for the rest of your life? I would say, why would I ever want to stop? It's giving me so much gifts on a daily basis. If I, if I for example, think like I'm starting my afternoon meditation and I'm five or ten minutes into it, and I think, oh, you know, you should get up and phone Miriam because you said you'd call her. And then I'll say to myself, well, you know, there's actually nothing you can do with these next 10 minutes that is going to be better for your brain than just staying right where you are and finishing your meditation. So I see it as an ongoing uh, health maintenance technique. I wouldn't see any reason to stop it. On the contrary, I'm looking forward to continuing. And uh, I hope that somebody out there listening may be inspired and may have, uh, I had a wonderful experience. I met a young man on the Acela, that's the train going from Washington to New York. And I just was at an an event in New York, a business event, and this young man in the suit comes up to me and says, you may not remember me. You met me on the Acela, but you told me what you were doing. You told me what you were writing. I didn't persuade him to do anything. He went, he got taught, he learned TM. He's now done even some advanced techniques. He says, it's changed my life. He says, since then, we had a baby, my wife had cancer, but she's better. But everything I was able to deal with much better because of my TM. So I really want to thank you. And would you mind giving me a hug? Oh, so that must I, have made you feel really good. It did, really, because it makes me realize how just a, a single exchange or a single interaction can, it doesn't always, but it can actually have a pivotal influence on the other person. And that's why it, it really emboldens me and it encourages me to be as positive as I can with every interaction that I have in the hope that maybe I will make the world a little bit of a better place. Well, I certainly think that you have made some wonderful contributions with both of your books about uh, TM, both Transcendence and Supermind. Have you been on a book tour? Yes, I have. Uh, I toured with my friend Bob Roth, to whom the book is dedicated. He's a very wonderful TM teacher and the head of the David Lynch Foundation, which does some great charity work for uh, getting TM to people who can't afford it. And we went all around the country and had a great time. Great. Well, I've had a great time speaking with you. We've been speaking with Norman Rosenthal, MD, about his book, Supermind. Norman, thank you so much for your book and for being with us today. Thank you. And my website is normanrosenthal.com. And we will have it posted on our show page. You're awesome. (laughs) Thank you, Norman. And thank you for listening. We'll be back (laughs) next week. I'm Miriam Knight. Be well. Have a wonderful week.